if we ever needed the Lord before, Lord, we sure do need Him now. Oh, sure do need Him now, my Lord. I said we sure do need Him now. Oh, glory if we ever needed the Lord before, Lord, we sure do need Him now. We need Him every day and every hour. We need Him in the morning. 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 Need Him in the night. 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 My Lord, we need Him at the noonday. Need Him at the noonday. Need Him at the noonday. Need him at the noonday when the sun is shining bright. If we ever needed the Lord before, Lord, we sure do need him now. Oh, sure do need him now. My Lord, I said we sure do need him now. Oh, glory if we ever needed the Lord before, Lord, we sure do need him now. We need Him every day and every hour. When the wind need Him when we're burning. 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 Need Him when we're sad. Need Him when we're sad. Need Him when we're sad. Need Him when we're sad, my Lord. We need Him when we're happy. Need Him when we're happy. Need Him when we're happy. Need it when we're happy and when our hearts are glad. If we ever needed the Lord before, Lord, we sure do need Him now. Oh, sure do need Him now. My Lord, I said we sure do need Him now. Oh, glory if we ever needed the Lord before, Lord, we sure do need Him now. We need Him every day and every program uh, stewardship where we talk business and money we hope you are being blessed kwese kwa muri mwari vaku treza kanaka mwari vaku chengete now once again we are so much blessed to to have our guest uh, miss nube and uh, yes, we are so glad to to have her on this particular program uh, how are you ma'am i'm very well thank you how are you no i'm excited to to talk to you today <laughs> thank you. Yes. Thank you for inviting me. Well, amen. We thank the Lord. Yes. Yes. Now, um, uh, Miss Nube is a, is, a, is a consultant. Is that so? Yes. And uh, a very powerful woman of God. Now, the, there is a bio that I was reading about yourself. Maybe uh, for the sake of our audience, uh, we would need to just uh, go through who is Miss Nube. And uh, from there, we will quickly then go to the subject of today. That's okay. Where we will uh, discuss issues to do with uh, uh, a, a business as a woman. Now, um, I was reading here about yourself. You could allow me to... Yes, by all means, to go, go ahead. To, yes. For the sake of our viewers, Miss Nube is a member of GCPT Seventh-day Adventist Church. And she has spent the last 16 years of her career working in the area of conflict, transformation, and peace building, where she has served in various senior advisory capacity with several United Nations development program, country offices in Africa and beyond. Um, uh, prior to Ms. Nube, she founded and managed a human capital development and executive search agency. She has also served as a co-trainer for Improtech. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard of Improtech uh, yeah. 
and I know some <coughs> people who have also done the program. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an entrepreneurship development organization and has trained over 700 entrepreneurs in Zimbabwe and Namibia during a five-year tenure. She is also a Gallup certified strength coach and assists individuals and organizations to identify and understand their strengths and adopt a strength-based approach to work and life. This is just a summary. I could have read uh, all, all of it, but the, the bio is just packed uh, with a lot of things that you have done over the years. <laughs> Uh, and we thank God for that. I like how you say you are a Seventh-day Adventist. Well, for me, mm -hmm. it is foundational. Mm. So that's why I, I mention it mm -hmm. up front. Yes. Yeah. Now, our, our subject for today is uh, a lesson for success for women. Uh, really looking at a male-dominant uh, uh, industry where male, where the males are, they seem to be uh, the ones who are taking over. Mm -hmm. But we now need to look at women being successful uh, in, in this business. Now, let's go to what, what, what inspiration do you, behind your starting of uh, the consultancy, starting you traveling all over the world internationally, what inspires you? Okay, so, my my parents mm -hmm. were were both professionals right. my father was a corporate person he was in marketing and sales he used to work for netbrew mm. and in in Bulawayo. and my mother is a nurse mm -hmm. by by training and a midwife but um for the greater part of her career she was actually working for the ministry of health as right. the provincial nursing officer for matebelele and south mm. and that involved a lot of travel okay and then my parents divorced when I was young, so I was raised by my mom. But what I saw in both of them is that they were very committed to their professions and right. to their work. Right. But they hardly had time for things that they loved doing. Mm. So I was very clear growing up that I wanted to own my time mm. and control how I used my time. I think that is what really informed this choice mm -hmm. to then be in a profession or in a business where I determined what I do when. Mm. Now, you may ask me, so, so what's the big deal about time? <laughs> I don't think back then I really fully understood the importance of owning your time as I do now. Mm. But I think what that does is it gives you choice to explore who you are, the breadth and the depth of who you are. Right. So for me, it has enabled me, as you rightfully say, mm -hmm. to work in different uh, regions, in different country contexts, and to work for the duration of time that I feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. At the same time, allowing me time to pursue other aspects of who I am. Right. And, and so really that, that was the foundational reason mm. why I opted to, to go into business for myself. The other part to it too is that by nature, I'm a person who struggles with monotony. I, I can't do the same thing for 20 years. I, I would just die. So I, I then, I guess, also wanted to be able to touch on the various areas of, of business or of life that I have an interest in and explore them, but, but have that common thread that enables me to still pursue what I feel is, is my calling. Mm. Yeah. So you, you, you have spoken of uh, your time yes. being, being very important. Yeah. Uh, and uh, for 20 years doing the same thing, you are not the type of... Uh, no, I would struggle. You, I really would have struggled with that. Die. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe for, 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 for people who are listening, for, for those who are watching us right now, for women, mm. you, you, we need to value time, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, time is your biggest currency that you have. It, it is not your education. It is not the money that you have. It's your time. Because it is the time that you trade to earn an, an income. It is the time that you trade to grow and, and develop yourself. It is the time that you trade to spend with your loved ones. It is the time that you trade for you to be able to travel and explore 
and explore the world. So when your time, the time, the portion of your time that you actually own and are in charge of is limited, then it means your growth is going to be limited. Mm. And, and yeah, for me, that, that doesn't quite work well. Uh, that is powerful. How are you spending your time? Are you, are you growing? Yes. When you are spending that uh, a little time that we have, 24 mm. hours in a day. Yeah. And all of us have 24 hours. Yes. And some are, are growing. Yeah. And are you growing as well? And you see, another piece to it too, Elder Modoni, is that as you grow older, you begin to realize that the most valuable things or the most valuable aspects of your life are the memories that you create with your loved ones. So growing up, my mother was always at work. I went to boarding school when I was 11 because she had to go and work, right? I was a weekly boarder, so I would go home at the weekend. But then the whole Sabbath, you are at church. Sunday morning, you wake up, there are family chores that you need to do. Afternoon, you're going back to hostel. So I never really got that much time to spend time, leisure time with my mom. But I'm thankful that now in her years of retirement, we've had maybe better opportunities to do that. So some of us, especially as women, if you're a career woman, you're a mother, you're a wife, you're a daughter-in-law, etc., you find that you are being pulled in all sorts of directions. Okay. And you hardly really have adequate time to invest sufficiently in relationships with your loved ones and, and in bonding and creating those memories. Mm. Because I tell you, you know, when, when you die, right, mm -hmm. people are not going to remember the number of dresses that you bought for them. Hey. They're not going to remember the, the, maybe they may remember the lunches that you took them <laughs> to, but what I'm saying is what sticks to the mind most is those moments of joy, of leisure, where memories were created. Mm -hmm. and, and people can then look back and say, indeed, I enjoyed spending time with my mother, with my child, or whoever it is. Mm. Yeah. Time is very precious. So you, you as being a consultant and you as a, as a person who has traveled all over the world, mm -hmm. um, what would you say are the, the, the foundational principles? Um, you know, I was trying to come up with something here that you have learned uh, as a woman who is uh, in business. Maybe give us three, uh, you know, those principles. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so we talk about me working in a male-dominated space. I think we need to unpack that right. a little bit more. Mm -hmm. The field of peace building and conflict is, is still fairly nascent, right? And as I say, I've been working in this area in the past, for the past 16 years. Right. Most of the advisors back then, it's, things have improved a little bit now, but right. most of the advisors back then mm -hmm. tended to be male. I guess in part because of the risks that are involved. Mm -hmm. Because we are often deployed to work in countries that are in crisis, countries that are in conflict, or countries that are emerging from violent conflict. So that's the one aspect of it. But the other aspect is that largely you are working with political actors. And we know that politics is predominantly a male-dominated space. Mm -hmm. And we often work in the higher echelons of the political space. So right. you're working with political leaders, party leaders, party chairpersons, secretaries general, mm. and, and national level political leaders mainly. Mm. So it's male dominated from these two um, perspectives. Right. Um, now you ask what principles inform my work as, mm. as a woman. First of all, I have always believed in the importance of being authentic. So when I show up in a workspace, I show up as me, mm. which means I am an African, mm -hmm. I am an African woman, and I am a black person. Mm -hmm. I have never felt the need to be apologetic about any of those. Mm. So I found that authenticity has enabled me to be true to who I am right. without compromising my effect effectiveness in, in the world of mm -hmm. work. And sometimes as women, we struggle when we are thrust in such environments because you then maybe sometimes feel the need to behave in the same manner as your male counterparts do mm -hmm. in order for you to have impact. Mm -hmm. But that is not a sustainable way of engaging right. because you are now not being 
your true yourself. self. And remember, as a consultant, mm. I am selling me first and foremost. Right. And then what I do and what I know. Right. Um, so I, I, yes, I, I just deal as me. Mm. I show up as me. I, I also make it very known to people that I am Adventist. So mm. Sabbath, I am not going to be available for work. But I also let them know that I, by nature, am an introvert. Right. And so there are times where I'll, I'll, I'll need to move away from them and just be on my own. Right. And that has served me well, mm. especially in, in the latter part of, of my career. Mm -hmm. The second principle that I live by is right. excellence. Mm -hmm. I, so when I show up, I am showing up as a professional. Right. And I am not showing up as a woman. So woman is not what I put up front. Black is not what I put up front. Mm. African is not what I put up front. What okay. I put up front is I am here, I am an advisor in this area because mm. of the technical competence that I bring to the table. Mm. But then I know that there are questions about can this woman really deliver? You know, this is an African. Are we sure she, she's going to be able to deliver <laughs> at the level yeah. that we expect? And therefore, excellence has always informed what I do mm. because... You see, you can't, you can't argue against excellence. You can't discriminate against right. excellence. And it has served me well. The third principle is I have always believed in being transparent mm -hmm. and upfront. I, whilst I am introverted, mm -hmm. I'm a very forthright person. Right. So I will tell you as it is. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I may be diplomatic mm -hmm. about the communication, the communication. but I'm, I'm always very upfront with people so that all of us, as we engage, mm -hmm. know exactly where we are and mm -hmm. what is expected of us. Mm. Yeah. You, you have mentioned those three. The first one is be yourself. Yeah. If you, if, if, if you want to be successful, mm -hmm. be yourself. Yeah. Uh, go out there, know who you are. Mm -hmm. And uh, number two, excellency. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, many times... There are people who are in business and uh, they, they are not making much profit because maybe they're not doing their things in a, in a very excellent way. Yeah. And uh, sometimes th there are people who are also there. They want you to buy things from them, mm. but it's not quality. Yeah. You know, so excellency mm. is, uh, is actually key. Yeah. So be, be the original yes, of absolutely. yourself and then you can, uh, you can actually make it in this life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you see, the beauty with excellence, too, is that you get to a stage where you are not going out there looking for work. Right. Work comes to you. Powerful. And as work comes to you, mm. you then engage on your terms. Yes. And then you command whatever fee you want mm. because people know that they will get value. Mm. But if you are mediocre, it, <laughs> it's going to be a struggle. Yes, they can play with <laughs> you and uh, give you a dollar. Yes. Because, uh, you know, you're, you're not there. Yeah. So if you're there, I like what you said. You can be home. They will call you. Yes, they will. I, I remember someone was saying that um, I've never applied for a job. Mm. Mm. They, they come looking for me. Yeah. And, and I mean, I say that with, with mm. humility. I don't say it from a place of cockiness. Right. But that's just the reality out there. Mm. Especially when you are now transacting internationally. Right. Because you see, when you are here in Zimbabwe, I can come up with all sorts of excuses and mm. say, ah, I couldn't deliver the report because there was a power cut. Mm. You under we are in the same context. You understand that. Right. But someone sitting in, in Netherlands or someone sitting in America mm. can't relate to that. Mm. And, and so you can't use that as an acceptable excuse for poor performance mm. or for not meeting deadlines. And it, it just won't sell. Mm. So you really have to make sure that you raise the bar. But part of it too is that as you excel, these other seemingly um, limiting factors right. of your race, mm -hmm. of where you come from, and of your gender, then fall away. Mm. Yeah. Mm, that's, that's good. And how, how has your faith uh, made an impact <laughs> um, in your you journey of success? If you talk to most peace builders, mm -hmm. they will tell you that the work that we do is, is very trying. And you can't be able to be effective and 
remain sane and coherent if you are not reliant on a higher power. Now, mm. for me, that higher power is God. Yeah. And most of the people that I've worked with, people who mentored me, mm. have very strong faith as well. They, they come from a Christian background. Mm -hmm. If you look at the, the leading luminaries in this field, people right. like John Paul Lederach right. and the Mennonites, right. it was in fact their faith that informed their desire to work with um, nations and peoples in conflict mm. to, to, to ha arrive at um, constructive right. resolution of those conflicts. Mm. So faith for me has really been the anchor of what I do. I mean, I've been in situations where at times people wanted to throw me under the bus mm. and you are sitting there, you're in this meeting and you can tell that these people are paying for your blood mm. and you're sitting there and you're praying. But what I've also found is that it has helped me calm me in situations where I can tell that okay, this process is now falling apart. Right. And I have been able to surrender and say, Lord, if, if this is the outcome mm -hmm. that ought to obtain at this moment, right. let me be okay with it. Mm. Because sometimes it's, it's very easy to then fall into the trap of thinking, I am the advisor, I am the one with the technical know-how here. Right. And if this process is not successful, I am the one who will take the flag. Mm -hmm. You know, it will be seen as though I am incompetent. I didn't know what I was doing. Yes. So it has enabled me to remove myself from that and not be so self-absorbed mm -hmm. and realize that sometimes things will happen the way they're meant to happen. Mm. I mean, I can share an experience right. in where, I think it was 2012. Right. I was working in, in one country in, in Central Africa. I will not mention it. Mm -hmm. They had just gone through a transition, a political transition. Mm -hmm. uh, the country was in turmoil. We went in. I was advising the UN resident coordinator, who is the most senior UN uh, person in country mm -hmm. and really represents the whole in United Nations system. They are also tasked, they also have a political mandate. Mm -hmm. So we then were working on establishing a mechanism mm -hmm. that would enable the country to engage in dialogue and try and have a more preventive approach to violent mm -hmm. conflict. So when we went in, conditions were not enabling for us to work directly with government, who right. is normally the implementing partner that we work with. Mm -hmm. And we then uh, uh, identified civil society, non-state organizations, yeah. faith institutions, women, yeah. youth, etc., that we could work with. And the process went on well. And then the political situation changed. A mm. new government came into power mm. and we now had a, a, a new president. So it made sense that we now engage government and mm. bring them on board. Right. So we had made significant headway with this group, mm -hmm. right? And we were now at a stage where I was to present to them a possible framework right. that could be adopted. Right. Cut long story short, mm -hmm. Um, we then decided, no, this is not the most strategic thing to do. We mm. actually need to bring government on board. So we then agreed that we're going to have a meeting with the, the steering group that had been established. And I then proposed to my government counterpart, so this program was going to be located in the president's office. And our contact person was the chief secretary to cabinet. And I had a, a technical person that I was working with. Mm -hmm. So we then agreed that at this steering group meeting, my counterpart from government would come in. I would then explain that this is what has now obtained. And he would come in and speak on, on behalf of government in terms of proposing a way forward. Yeah. We had just concluded a workshop in a different location and my counterpart was there. Right. So the meeting was going to take place the next day mm -hmm. in the morning. So in the evening, he then says to me, oh, are you free? So I said, yes, I'm free. He says, let's meet at the bar and, and just discuss a few things. Mm -hmm. So I say, sure, okay. I get there and I'm thinking we are strategizing about the meeting tomorrow. Right. Then he says to me, oh, I, I have some news for you. So I said, yes, okay. He says, I have been called back to the capital city and I have to report at eight. And then I say to him, but William, you can't do this. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we have this crucial meeting tomorrow. Mm -hmm. He says, yes, I discussed with Madame, the chief secretary was, was a lady. Mm -hmm. And he says, Madame said, you can speak for us. And I said, but I can't. Mm -hmm. How do I speak on behalf of, of, of government? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and he says, no, she said, you're quite capable, so we'll you leave it in it. your hands. And I knew right then that, oh, oh, this is going to be a mess. So the next day, the meeting starts, there's this expectation from, from these people. Mm -hmm. And um, I then say to them, oh, there's a new development. And I read the letter from government where they were now requesting that they be brought to speed through a separate process. Right. I remember one retired ambassador saying to me, this can't happen, it's not on. You, can you photocopy the letter and share, share it with us? Mm. And I said, but say, you know I can't. You, this is a letter that is addressed to the resident coordinator. You are not in copy. So the best I can do is read the letter, but I can't photocopy it and share it. Oh, and then he went on a whole long tirade about he was not happy. Cut long story short, they then say, after five hours of going back and forth, one lady in the meeting says, but really we are being unreasonable. So let's allow the government process to take place and let's work together. Mm -hmm. But this man then says, we demand to, to have a meeting, an audience with the resident coordinator when we're back in the capital city. So I had to organize that. Mm -hmm. And I knew that, yeah, you know, my, my head here yeah. is definitely on the block. On the block yeah. However, I had a very good working relationship with my boss. He was Dutch, a highly accomplished diplomat and one who really understood how to navigate sticky situations. Mm. So these people came the following week for the meeting. They had a long dossier like this of complaints, I, I would imagine. Mm. And you know when you go and receive people right. and they can't even look you in the mm. eye. But I saw the hand of the Lord in that meeting. First of all, I briefed my boss and he had assured me that, look, I, you know, I, I'm going to cover you. You did nothing wrong. You mm. did the right thing. So rest assured, we are okay. You'll be fine. And he then walked into the meeting and he started offering everybody tea or coffee. He was a, he was a big man, but mm. very jovial and pleasant. Right. Offered everybody tea, coffee, started talking, had just come back from leave, talked mm. about that, diffused the tension. Mm -hmm. And then he went on to explain that um, it was necessary to involve government. I remember he said, government is the railway line. We are the train. Without the railway line, there is nothing, we, nothing can we can do. I, you know, throughout the meeting I was praying, but what sealed the deal for me was, so they then come back and say, okay, we, we accept that we need to involve government, but these are our terms. He then turned to me, I was sitting on his right, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I am not um, a subject matter expert in this. Mm. My advisor is Busi, and what Busi says is what we will do. Mm -hmm. So he then turned to me and said, what is your proposal of a way forward? I tabled the proposal, it was accepted, mm. and, and that's how I was res rescued. Wow. I could count so many other such, uh, experiences. such experiences mm -hmm. where really you can just see that God brings in the right people mm -hmm. to aid your cause, but to diffuse tension and to allow the work to go forward. Mm. So lessons yeah. in success. Uh, our faith is, is, is the way to go. I our, mean, our I don't know in. about other sectors. I can't speak mm. for other sectors and other mm. people. But for me, I found, yes, it, it is probably the, the foundation. It is the cornerstone mm. of, of my work. Mm. That's, that's, that's powerful. Now, there's, there's this, um, uh, this uh, question again, mm -hmm. where we, the experience of leading other women uh, <laughs> in, in business. Uh, how do you uh, deal with that, you know? W women being in business, fine. Dealing with other women who are in business and also being a, maybe you are the one who is a subordinate to, to another woman. You know, what I've, what I've learned over the years mm -hmm. is that especially if you are in a male-dominated environment right. and, and you are good at what you do, right. I found that men uh, sometimes, I don't know whether they do it consciously or subconsciously, mm -hmm. but they will find ways of sabotaging you. Mm -hmm. Maybe because they feel threatened, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So having realized that, whenever I've been in a position where I am reporting to a woman, I always endeavor to cover their back. Again, I'll share an experience where we were in a mediation process with... Um, a special envoy that had been deployed and mm. under Secretary General. Now, oh. this is someone who reports directly to the Secretary General. Mm. She was a woman, an African woman too. 
in this mediation process. And so we are in this meeting. I wasn't even her advisor. She had mm. rejected, for whatever reason, I don't know, the assigned advisor, mm. who unfortunately also happened to be my mentor. So we had discussed this and we couldn't understand why she had done that. Mm. But anyway, so the, the meeting starts, it's with government representatives and s civil society representatives. Right. And then civil society people then say, we are walking out of this meeting unless um, one of the human rights lawyers who had been incarcerated is released. Mm -hmm. This woman sat there, she was stunned, she didn't know what to do. These guys stood up and walked out. But she had her own political advisor that she had come with, mm -hmm. right? But again, I could tell that this young lady was out of her depth. Mm -hmm. So I then said, look, we now need to call a caucus, adjourn this meeting, and call a caucus with civil society actors. This girl then says to me, you go and say, tell Madame this. Mm -hmm. So I then go, I introduce myself, I whisper that perhaps this is how we should handle this. Mm. And so you need to tell the government delegation to remain here whilst we go and find a separate venue to caucus with civil society. She says to me, you tell them. This was, I was just in that meeting by, I don't know why they had called me to the meeting because mm. I was not really part of that team. Mm -hmm. So I then introduce myself and one former government minister looks at me and says, who are you? And rightfully so. Anyway, what <laughs> I saw out of that was mm. this lady was probably being treated this way because she was a woman. Mm. But she herself had not adequately prepared or had been adequately prepared for the task and the possible um, eventualities. Right. So... And then she then says to me, okay, so how do we proceed? We prefer, and I say, okay, I'm going to go and write the questions that we need to explore. She then says, okay, I am going to now have a meeting and update the American ambassador and I think the EU ambassador. Because I was now, because I was in country, I knew that these were the very people mm -hmm. that were behind what had just happened. Okay. Um, so there are many instances where either intentionally or perhaps by one's own lack of understanding the context and preparedness, women are thrown in sticky situations like mm. that. And I found that as a subordinate, right. my duty mm -hmm. is to cover for that woman. Because that's what men do, you know. Men will cover for each other like you've never seen. True. I have seen highly incompetent people <laughs> being promoted because yeah. their brother comes from the same country and they cover for them. Mm. So as a subordinate, that has always been my, my approach of choice. Mm. Now leading women, I have found that sometimes you get some women who are resistant to your leadership. And, and I guess that's part of you know, how we're socialized. We're socialized to look up to men and not necessarily to look up to another woman. Mm. And that is problematic. I really wish as women we would do things differently. But that said, I have also worked with young women and even older women than myself who have been so supportive is unreal. And I have been in teams where as women we have moved an agenda and stuck to it despite significant male opposition. Mm. But, but let me say that I think it's important for us as women to stick together and work together mm. and support each other. Wow. This put her down syndrome is yes. counterproductive. Yes, because we say uh, in, in, in the streets, mm -hmm. uh, this is what many people believe, that uh, in Shona they say, same place, you know. Yes. So uh, it seems like it's a, it's a culture, but I like how you are coming with an issue for, for women to be successful, we, we need to cover each other. Mm, mm, we mm. need to, to protect each other. We need to work together. And we need to promote and each other. And we need to promote each other, yeah. just like as uh, the men are doing. Yes. I, I, I loved how you have also said that men are actually covering each other. But is that not true? Uh, that's very <laughs> true. Um, so women need to do the same yes. uh, to raise the standard of, uh, of yeah. success. You have also mentioned the issue to, to, to do with uh, your um, you have spoken many times as we were discussing issues mm -hmm. to do with mentorship. Yeah. Uh, talk to me about mentorship. Uh, you know, uh, many people do not believe in, uh, in, in being mentored by, by someone. As, as women, uh, are, are there women who would want to be mentored by another woman? Okay, let me start off by sharing a proverb that 
is often used in, in my language in right. Debele. I'm sure there is a Shona equivalent mm -hmm. that says in Lela Ibuzwa Kwaba Pambi. Right. Mm -hmm. Now that is a very, very profound um, proverb. Right. Especially if you are in a male dominated industry. Mm. You need someone to show you the ropes. You need someone to hold your hand. Mm. But in our work too, you need someone where you can go and unburden. Mm. Because remember, you are the, the go-to technical advisor right. in any situation, right? right? Everybody is looking up to you. So you can't be vulnerable to as much as you ordinarily would. So you need that person that off-site, mm -hmm. you can go and unburden to, you can go and cry if you need to cry. Mm -hmm. um, you can go and rant and rave if you need to. Mm -hmm. um, what I have found though, in terms of mentorship right. is, I have found excellent women who are willing to mentor young, young, young people. Mm -hmm. I come back to my issue of excellence. So when I left university, I worked with um, a, a women's organization known as the Zimbabwe Women's Resource center and network. Mm -hmm. I, it was a contract where I was coordinating some research project. And I remember one day Hope Chigudu asked me to go and do some work for her at her house, organize her files, etc. And as we were conversing, she said to me, we'll see, one thing you need to adopt as a principle in, in life and in your career is never attach your name and your signature to a document that you would not be proud of having authored. Mm. I, she said it casually, but it stuck with mm. me, right? And what I would also say, though, about mentorship is women shouldn't just look for fellow women mentors. You actually need male mentors. Right. And I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. As a woman, I, I got into business very young, in mm. my 20s. I also used to do SMI, you know, Success Motivation yeah. International. I had a franchise, and I was doing that. And what I found is... When you have a male mentor who can speak to his peer on your behalf mm -hmm. and, and sell you and say she's good, mm -hmm. give her an appointment. Yes. It, it unlocks many doors for mm. you. I have, in my career, I have had amazing male mentors who have helped me with remaining resolute, strong, mm -hmm. and, and, and really pushing myself mm. To, to step up to those spaces where ordinarily as a woman, I would have thought, mm, maybe I don't qualify. Because so many times as women, we are quick to look at what, so for instance, there's a call for a proposal or a job advert. Mm -hmm. The default setting for most women is to disqualify themselves by saying, I don't meet this criterion, I don't meet this criterion. So you then need a male mentor that can say to you but my sister you can remember you've done this here you've done that there so m for me mentors are indispensable mm. now you don't always have to know your mentor or have a relationship with your mentor right. you can also have people that are role models to you mm -hmm. and for me when i entered the international space the one person that i used as my role model is mama grasha Marshall. mama grasha is an african woman short hair, natural hair, mm -hmm. African accent, mm -hmm. unapologetic, but interacting at the highest levels internationally. Mm. So it is both mentors and role models. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's strong stuff there. <laughs> you, you are giving us uh, <laughs> uh, a powerful wisdom. Mm. Um, now, there is, um, from your experience, how can a woman start a business? Can women also start businesses? Of course women can start business. And women have started successful businesses many times over. We have good examples here in Zimbabwe. When mm. I was at Emprotec, I interacted with a lot of successful women, women. entrepreneurs. Mm. You have people like Divine Lugula. Yeah. There are so many others. Mm. Who, again, Divine is a very good example of yes, a I woman know. who owns a security company, mm -hmm. which is often a male-dominated uh, space. Mm. Um, so what I would say is that Perhaps the starting point is to work on yourself. Right. Have that self-belief, that self-confidence that I can mm. and I will. Now, we come from different backgrounds mm -hmm. and our, our, our bringing has a large part to play in, in terms of that self, nurturing that self-confidence and right. that self-belief. Mm -hmm. So if you are one of those women who were raised to believe that you can't, mm. then you need to find a group of people that will affirm you. And, and support your idea. Mm. It, 
you know, starting a business is not easy. It, you're going to spend the next five years of your life working very hard, mm -hmm. taking, you know, very small steps, small steps but you there. need to be persistent. Right. And sometimes as women, we tend to give up too quickly. Or you start a business and it doesn't work because it's not you mm -hmm. or it's not your calling. I mean, way back when the fuel crisis started here in Zim, mm -hmm. I, I got into fuel. I've done many things. <laughs> I got into fuel. Uh -huh. There was <laughs> my cousin-in-law who had a license. Mm. I would order product from them. Right. And I remember at some point I paid the money, you know, back in the days when we had these big bags of mm. money. I paid the money. Their product took forever to come. And I said, I want my money back. Mm -hmm. One of the guys who worked with him mm -hmm. then brought the money to my house in the evening. And we sent the set the counting it, counting it. I then got out of that sector. Two of my friends, including this guy who brought the money back, mm. have become phenomenally wealthy today in fuel. Mm -hmm. Maybe that was their calling, it wasn't mine. Okay. So it's very easy at times to then say, because you've started something that has not worked, mm -hmm. to then give up and start seeing yourself as a failure. Mm. And uh, I think this is what a lot of women suffer from, this lack of persistence and this quick default to think, I'm a failure, I was not cut out to this right. for this. Especially if you then don't have support from your immediate family. Mm. I know a lot of women who are put down by their spouses, by the way, or, or their siblings or whatever, and say, look, who, who do you think you mm. are to think you can transact at these levels? Mm, and that is it. most unfortunate. But yes, women can and mm. women have. Mm. So it goes back to the point of then mm. looking for people mm -hmm. that will support your vision and support your dream and put in the sweat equity until you get there. Mm. Especially the family members, those that are close yeah. to you are the ones who need to support yeah. the dream, support yeah. the ideas. Mm. And or uh, sometimes you hear husbands say, why, why would you want to start a stockbroking business? Go and do catering, go and... Um, do decor. You mm. know, they, we, we <laughs> seem to think that there are certain businesses that are okay for women to do mm. and there are certain businesses that are not okay for women to do. And I just think that is so wrong. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and how do men uh, set women for failure? Uh, that that happens uh, all the time. Does that happen really? It does happen. It does happen. Mm. Um, so in my field, I have seen this happen in various ways. Sometimes it's through withholding of information, crucial information that you need for you to be successful mm. in, in the intervention that you are pursuing. At times it is outright insubordination. At other times you will be sidelined mm. and you will not be given voice when, when in actual fact you have something to contribute. to contribute. So the thing is to then, what I have personally learned is don't invest time in fighting unnecessary battles. Pick mm. your battles wisely. Powerful. And also identify the landmines and, and navigate around them. Avoid the landmines. Mm -hmm. And I have actually found that being a woman and doing the work that I do has served me very well. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes you're coming into a context and you're being underestimated. Especially when we're now dealing with uh, political actors. Yeah. And, and they will then give you information very freely because they think they're talking above your head mm -hmm. and <laughs> they think you know ah, she's harmless mm. what what is she uh, going what to can do, she do yeah. so it is then about playing the game from your position of strength mm. and not trying to play the game from a male position because you are weak you you don't understand how mm -hmm. males do things mm. but yes yeah i mean mm. there are so many examples i could cite of that but what i want to say is play on your terms engage on your terms, which comes back to the issue of authenticity. Right. I've also found that, it, that it's not helpful to be confrontational as a woman. Mm. And I guess being African has also served me well because I will approach things from a respectful position unless and until you push me to a point where I realize, okay, now, mm -hmm. you know, we, we need to define and yes. set boundaries here. Mm -hmm. um, but that is on very rare occasions. So yeah. I'll be very respectful and I often seek to ask. So I don't tell before I have asked. Mm -hmm. And even as I make my proposals and suggestions, I do it in a way that, you know, plays to this person's ego, if that's what I need to do, right. um, in order for me to attain my objective. So the focus is on the goal. Mm. And this person is a means to attaining the goal. So I right. will then work with them mm -hmm. in a manner that disarms them 
and I have found that that lessens the the instances of you know people trying to undermine you know and and stuff but if it's a subordinate now mm -hmm. who i can see is intentional and consistently trying to undermine right. me then i will read you the riot act mm -hmm. and i will do it so effectively that mm -hmm. we will not get a repeat of that mm -hmm. yeah and yeah. then after that i move forward it's done mm -hmm. because sometimes people also say that as women we carry crutches unnecessarily yes and fortunately my personality is that i will tell you as it is once I've offloaded, we are done, we're it's good, done. and mm. we move forward. Mm. Yeah. So lessons for success, uh, grudges. No, there's no room it's, for it's that. There's no room for that. Yeah. You need and to focus on the goal. Yeah, and, and I guess sometimes as women too, we need to be in control of our emotions. Don't argue from a, an emotional position. Argue from facts. Right. Yeah, mm. because again, you know, facts are facts. Mm, that's powerful. Now there's, um, I think this, this is another question that was interesting to me, mm. is um, how did you manage to, you know, you, you, you are speaking on an international level mm -hmm. uh, as a woman, mm. you know, the, the different cultures, mm. you know, and uh, facing all these things. You know, that, that, that power, that vibe of you to keep on going is, um, is, 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 is quite something that maybe someone who is listening would want to get there. Because maybe sometimes we think in Zimbabwe only doing business here. Mm. But as women, I think we need to think internationally. Absolutely. All over. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, I don't want to ascribe a lot of it to what I have done. Right. I think it is just God's favor and grace mm -hmm. in many ways. Right. And mind you, there are many Zimbabwean women that are doing phenomenal stuff on, on the international arena. So mm. I, 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 you know, I'm not one of a handful. I'm yeah. one of many. Mm. But when I look back, I think perhaps my upbringing has contributed some. Right. So I, I told you I went to boarding school mm -hmm. um, at the age of 11. And this was just before independence. Right. So I went to a white government school. Mm -hmm. I was the only black child in hostel. Mm. So there were two of us. There was a black guy who was a day scholar and I was a, a boarder. And so interacting mul multiculturally mm -hmm. uh, for me began at a very young, at age. A very young age. Yeah. My family is spread across Southern Africa. So over the holidays, I would either go to Botswana, mm -hmm. to South Africa or to Zambia. You are interacting yeah, all with all different over, cultures place, yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm also thankful to my parents in that they exposed me to travel at a very young age too. Mm. My dad always had the saying of his that um, whenever there was a school trip, for instance, I remember mm. in grade seven there was a trip to, to England. And I had initially thought my, my parents can't afford this, but I had a, a schoolmate whose dad worked with my dad. He was a white guy. Mm. And so Martin told his dad, and then my dad said, send me the form and we will pay for you. He always had this mantra of his that traveling broadens the mind. Mm. And so now, many years later, when I am now working internationally, I am not working from a position of disadvantage. Mm. I am not coming into a space and saying, oh my God, mm. I am now interacting with mm, Bazungu. Yes. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I'm interacting as an, in, as an equal. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of times, again, People from the global south have struggled with that because right. they have this stereotypical notion of what an African is and mm. what an African woman ought to be. Ought to be. And, uh, and oftentimes I am not that. Mm. But it goes back to what I said earlier. Just be authentic. Show up as yourself. Mm. Be confident in your ability. And, and that's what you need to, to put um, up front. Mm. Yeah. That's, uh, and then everything else is just incidental. It's in, so I'm an international facilitator mm -hmm. who is an effective facilitator. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, I am African living in Africa. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, I am black. Incidentally, I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. Be yeah. proud of yourself. Yeah. 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 And um, life goes on. Yes. Uh, d don't, <laughs> don't live for others. <laughs> just, just be yourself. Ah, it's, be it's hard to live for others. Mm. Because, you know, there are all these different people with different expectations. So whose expectations are you going to live up to at any one given time? Yes. Yeah, it's a big ask. Mm. That's, <laughs> that's, that's powerful. Now, um, I think we have about five minutes or so. Mm -hmm. um, I would want you to, to, to summarize, talk to uh, women out there. Mm. 
uh, just a summary of what we have been discussing about. Yeah. In a in a world where men are all over, mm -hmm. and sometimes women are looked um, down, mm -hmm. but we can do it. Yeah. We can achieve greatness. Mm. We can open companies as women. Yeah. In our churches, you know, we can we can do big things. Yeah, now you touch on a very sticky one, that mm -hmm. church one. Right. But anyway, let's leave it. That's not our conversation <laughs> we, will, for uh, we will discuss it on, <laughs> on, another, on another date. Yeah. But um, uh, just talk to someone in the next three minutes or so or less okay. in summary. Yeah. What I would say is that the starting point is to recognize that you have a stewardship responsibility hmm. over the gifts and abilities that God has given you right. over the opportunities that God has brought your way. Mm. And one day you will need to give an account. So forget what everybody else is saying, because mm. when you have to give that account, it will be a one on one. Mm. Secondly, what I would like to say to women is that we can and we need to internalize the fact that we can. Mm. There are women who've come from amazingly disadvantaged backgrounds, right. but who have held this self-belief and have achieved, so you can too. Right. The third point is that find male mentors who believe in you, who mm. believe in your vision, and use them to unlock opportunities and doors. Mm. But above all, be true to who you are, pursue excellence, mm. and don't compromise your values for anything. And I can assure you, success will be guaranteed. Beautiful. With God on your side, all things are possible. Amen. Can you pray for us? Yes, Thank shall you. we pray? Our most loving Heavenly Father who is in heaven, but who is also down below through God the Holy Spirit. We thank you for this conversation that we have had. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, and we thank you for the gifts that you have bestowed on each one of us. I pray this morning that this conversation may be a seed in Amen. someone's life, in some woman's life, mm. who has been doubting herself, who has been fearful, May, Lord, that woman realize that with you, all things are possible. Mm -hmm. I also pray for family members of such women. Mm. Speak to them, Lord, and help them to buy into the vision that these women carry, to right. be enablers and not frustrators. Mm. And when all is said and done, Lord, I pray that you may be lifted up and that all of us may desire to pursue the purpose and the plans that you have for us and know without a shadow of doubt that though challenges come, Ultimately, your plans for us will succeed. Mm. I pray for the coordinators of this program, Mandara mm -hmm. Church, continue to bless them and give them the resources Amen. to spread this, this um, message to many people who need it. Mm -hmm. We ask for all this through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and our King. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for watching. May God bless you. May God keep you.
say.